Hallelujah. Oh, let's shout for the victory of Jesus. He's a good God all the time. It's true anyhow. <laughs> good morning, Christ Church. Oh, it's such a pleasure to be with you today, to be in your presence, and to thank God for who he is. Amen? Because it is all about him. This morning, I'm going to be speaking on grace. We've been talking for the, this whole month about grace, and today I'm going to conclude the series with a teaching that I've titled, Grace, God's Unmerited Favor. As grace is something that we cannot earn, nor is it something that we could ever pay back. It is unmerited. Well-known pastor and author A.W. Tozer put it this way. Grace is the good pleasure of God that inclines him to bestow benefits on the undeserving. And the undeserving, my friend, is you and I. Let's pray. God, we thank you for today. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you, God, that we have the opportunity to sit under your word. So today we ask, God, that you would illuminate your word to us so that we will grow and be the disciples that you've called us to be. I thank you for it. I give you the glory for it, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this morning I want to start this teaching in Romans chapter 11. If you would please go with me there to Romans chapter 11. When you're there, say amen. If you're not there, say wait. Too many waits. Romans chapter 11 verse 6 says, And if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it were grace... If it were, grace would no longer be grace. If grace was made or defined by works, then it would not be grace. Because grace is altogether free. And if it becomes works, then it loses its nature. It loses its essence. It loses what God has called it to be, which is a free gift, which is an unmerited gift. So grace cannot be works. We do not deserve it. We cannot earn it. There is no holiness of our own. But grace, it regenerates us. It sanctifies us. It justifies us. It pardons us. We are who we are because of grace. Because of God's unmerited favor upon us. I realize that it's not my, my education. It's not my learning. It's not my industry. It's not my occupation. That doesn't make me who I am. God, his free favor, his gift makes me who I am. And even the little things that has to do with my efforts or our efforts and continues to be our responsibilities is still only active because it is a response of grace. Now, most dictionaries, like the Oxford English Dictionary, define grace as smoothness and elegance of movement, courteous goodwill, Attractively polite manner. That's grace. Your grace. I have graced you with my presence. That's grace. That's the definition that we often see when we look it up in the dictionary. It says, that's what grace is. And then you'll find in some dictionaries, there's this parenthesis. And in the parenthesis, it says... In Christian belief, it means the unmerited favor of God. So they make that, they make sure that they place it 
where you, it, it divides itself from the worldly definition of grace. This suggests to me that the overwhelming definition of grace has nothing to do with unmerited favor. Because the world views it as an action, as work somehow. And as we stated earlier, if grace becomes work, then it's not grace. So why is that? I submit to you that's because there is not a full, total understanding of what unmerited grace is. And because we hear the word free, I think that's the thing. I think that's the term. I think that's the word that, that gets people shaken, or as the young people say, shook. They say, I'm shook. I heard one girl say, I'm shooketh. <laughs> I said, okay. That's a whole new level of shook. And so, and so I think that that word somehow that it is free is what makes us, or, or, or we can't, our intellect cannot process it. We can't grasp hold of the fact that God says that this is free and you owe nothing to me for it. It's unmerited. You didn't earn it. You don't deserve it. But I'm giving it to you because of who I am, because I am God. And for us, that word free, it does not translate because we have grown up our entire lives and someone said, nothing is for free. You've got to earn success. No one's going to give you anything. We have that conversation with our children all the time. We pass that on. We pass that on that everything costs something. So then when we get into Christianity, right, and, and someone says to you, oh, God is giving you a free gift, we automatically think, oh, wait, it's a trick. There is something to this. And I'm going to find out what it is. Because surely, God cannot be giving me something free. And so in order for us to relate or be able to get um, the Christians and the believers to understand, we say, well, salvation is free, but it'll cost you everything. And then we understand, right? Because we say, I know what it means to cost something. I know what it means to have to work for something. I get that part. But that free thing, mm -mm. I'm going to have to pray and study and seek the face of God concerning free. But God says, I give it freely. Rejoice in the freedom of God. Because he's not going to take it back. He's not going to ask you for it. Even when you sin and you repent, God says, grace. unmerited favor is always going to be there. Theologian Martin Luther says, if God were willing to sell his grace, we would accept it more quickly and gladly than when he offers it for nothing. Because that's the mentality that we live under. And even when you're trying to demonstrate grace, sometimes people say, don't do it. Don't give it to them. They don't deserve it. They don't deserve it. I was driving one day. And I think it was in Newark. And I was driving in Newark. I happened to be, I think, working in that area at the time. And I was driving in the car, and there was this homeless man on the side of the street. And I stopped to give the man some money. I felt compelled to give him some money. And the guy in the car next to me started blowing his horn. So I look over. He's like, don't do it. Don't give it to him. And I was like, what? He was like, don't give it to him because he does not deserve it. And I said, first of all, you in my car, in my business, <laughs> T 
telling me what to do. But he said, because he said, he's just going to take it around the corner. He and his brother, they're going to drink it up. Don't do it. Even when we try to demonstrate the unmerited favor of God because of the environment that we find ourselves in, even then people say, no, don't do it. Because there's no such thing as unmerited favor, and there's no such thing as free. I gave that man that money, and I said, <laughs> do with it what you will, because it's God's unmerited favor. It has nothing to do with what you're going to do with it. It just has to do with the fact that God wants to give it to you. So it has nothing to do with that. Over the last few weeks, we have seen many occasions of grace operating in the New Testament. But today, I want to take a look at this unmerited favor in the Old Testament. Now, it is a common misconception for many to think that the Old Testament is, and the New Testament are two separate categories, law and grace. But God has always been, is today, and forever will be gracious. So there are accounts in the Old Testament where we see the unmerited favor of God. Because God is just gracious and God is just God. And God, there's no delineation between Old and New Testament. God has no delineation between you and me. God doesn't look at that. God is just God. And his favor is just his favor. So turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel, we're looking at verse 9, uh, chapter 9, sorry, chapter 9 of 2 Samuel. There are two things that I want you to pay a close attention to in this particular chapter because there are two things that are going to happen in this demonstration of grace because I believe that this particular chapter has a beautiful picture of the unmerited favor of God. So we're looking at chapter 9, and of course it is about David. I love David. Do you love David? David is my guy. David is my Old Testament guy. And Paul is my New Testament guy. So when I look at Old Testament and New Testament, when I look at the Old Testament, I say, that's, that's David and them. And them. You got to do the and them part. And the New Testament, that's Paul and them. That's Paul and them. I know, and them, and them, and them. So I want to just give you a brief background, backdrop, sorry, of what's happening, what's led up to chapter 9. So in chapter 1 of 2 Samuel, what happens is Jonathan and Saul are killed in battle. Jonathan, of course, is David's best friend, his buddy. He loves him as he loves his own soul. And he dies in the battle. In chapter 2 through 5, there's this violent struggle between the house of David and the house of Saul, which David and his army win. And during those years, David becomes a strong warrior. In chapter 6, David brings the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem and restores the manifest presence of God back to Israel. So, you know, that's the, script, that's the scriptures where David is dancing and he dances out of his clothes and his wife is upset. So he gains the God and he loses his wife. Hallelujah. Then in chapter 9, he begins to sit back and consider all his great works and what he has done. But this is the chapter where we see the unmerited favor of God. And we have to understand what leads up to it because what leads up to it shines the light on the unmerited favor. Okay? So David, verse 1, asks, Is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now, kindness here is the Hebrew word that means hasad, hased, hased. And hased is unmerited, gracious, favor. So he's looking for someone that he can show this kindness to. Now, there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. 
they summoned him to appear before David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? At your service, he replied. The king asked, Is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? God's hasad, a God hased, God's mercy, God's unmerited favor. Now, the interesting part about this is because when one dynasty takes over another dynasty, the dynasty that is now in control executes everyone in the old dynasty. That's the way that it was. It was normal. So David here is calling for someone who was in the house of Saul. So you can imagine, even Ziba the servant is thinking, oh, he's going to kill him. Because by all rights, he could. And he should. But unmerited favor. Someone say unmerited favor. Unmerited favor. So Ziba answered the king, there is still a son of Jonathan. He is lame in both feet. Where is he? The king asked. Ziba answered, he is at the house of Makir, son of Amiel in Lodabar. Lodabar. So King David had him brought from Lodabar, from the house of Makir, son of Amiel. Now Lodabar is known as the house of no bread. And David was born in Bethlehem, which is known as the house of bread. So the house of bread is calling the house of no bread to come and dwell together. Mercy, unmerited favor. David said, Mephibosheth. When Mephibosheth, let's go back to chapter, verse 6. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness. For the sake of your father, Jonathan, I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, what is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? He says to the king, what am I that you would even notice me? Oh, can we relate to Mephibosheth? Can we relate to feeling a certain way? And God's unmerited favor came in and brought us home and loved us even when we didn't love ourselves. God's unmerited favor took this man who, we, if we look back into 2 Samuel 4.4, 4, the reason he was lamed is because in the midst of the battle, when his father and his, gr and his grandfather were being killed, his nurse picked him up to take him away from the battle, and he fell. The Bible says he fell. I think she dropped him. Because the logic is, if I'm running with someone, is it for me, can I fall? But that's a whole nother sermon. <sighs> so he fell. And when he fell, he became lame. How many times we have been in the midst of the battle and we fall? We fall trying to get to safety. We, we fall when we're trying to do what's right. We fall. And we end up lame. And then God comes along. Grace comes along. A merited favor comes in and gives us a second chance. Because we serve the God of a second chance. We serve the God of a second chance. Oh, I don't know about you, but that makes me feel good to know that I serve a God of a second chance. So no matter what happens to me, no matter what I go through, no matter what I feel, I know that his grace is sufficient. It's sufficient for everything that I go through. So then he says, then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's steward, and said to him, I have given your master 
your master's grandson, everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring in the crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for. And Mephibosheth's grandson of your master will always eat at my table. Now, Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Yes, Lord, be fruitful. Then Ziba said to the king, your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servant to do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah, and all the members of Ziba's household were servants of Mephibosheth. Say that like 10 times fast. They lived in Jerusalem because he was always ate at the king's table. He was lame in both feet. Why was it important to reiterate the fact that he was lame in both feet? Again, to let us know that God's unmerited favor is enough. And regardless of what we go through and regardless of what we may be feeling, his grace is sufficient. David teaches us a lesson in these, this particular chapter. He teaches us a lesson that when we are blessed by God, we should bless. And that when God blesses, we should receive. Because David did not have to show mercy to this young man. He could have killed him and no one would have said anything about it. No one would have cared. No one would have, it wouldn't have mattered because he would have been doing what he rightly could do. And when we think about us, we think about that we are the ancestors of Adam who sinned in that garden. And even unmerited favor is seen there because God could have killed him, but he didn't. He showed grace. He had a greater plan, so he just let them leave the garden. But that blood is in us. We have the propensity to sin. We have the propensity to do the wrong thing all the time. But God's favor says, come on and eat at my table. Have a seat, relax, and don't worry, you'll eat here for the rest of your life. You'll eat with the kings, and you'll eat with the high officials, and, and you'll be having a table that, that's laid before you, and, and no longer will you be in the house of no bread. You will now forever be in the house of bread. And God is saying the same thing to us, that you no longer have to live in the house of no bread. So don't get caught up on the words. Don't get caught up on the outside things. Don't get that distract you. Don't like the definition that has no, no connection to what unmerited favor is. Don't let, it, don't let it stop you. Don't let it hinder you. Don't let the fall hinder you. Keep fighting. Because the unmerited favor of God will always shine, always be there for you. So we should be able to relate to him. Because there are things in our past. These are things that happened years ago. There are things that happened months ago. There are things that happened yesterday that tried to cripple us. but God's unmerited favor. It says, though you were lost, now you're found. And all we have to do is ask, and all we have to do is say, God, here I am. Take me. Use me for your, for your goodness and your kindness. This is the season of giving, right? This is what we call it. We call it the season of giving. So let us demonstrate this unmerited favor this season. Let us bless someone that really doesn't deserve to be blessed. And watch that person's life change because they even know, oh, I didn't deserve, I didn't deserve that. 
But there's something about the person who decided to give it to me. And I want to know what made him or her different. It's because of his grace. And if I can't give that to someone, am I being obedient to the word of God? I want to be like David. I want to show God's grace and his mercy. In 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, Paul says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. And what is God's example of Christ? Is that unmerited favor be an attribute that we display in season and out of season, happy or sad, angry or grieving. In all seasons, we are to give God's grace and his kindness. For who are we if it were not for grace? We have not come to this point, and we should never be at a point where we feel like, oh, I have arrived. I'm here now. I don't need grace. I have longevity. And longevity is going to take me over. But the very moment we say that is the very moment that we miss out on grace. And, and, and we've got to stop talking about how, you know, how quick we say, my grace has run out. I have no more grace for that. We do that with people. We say, I have no more grace for that person. It's run out. I have no more grace for this situation. It's run out. But if God never runs out of grace, and we are examples of Christ, then why should we run out of grace? Why should we not display this unmerited favor of God? Amen? Amen. Turn to one someone and say unmerited favor. You say, yeah, I'm very in favor. <laughs> like you got a turkey hangover. I'm married in favor. <laughs> Turn to someone and say it like you mean it. Unmerited favor. favor. There it is. Hallelujah. We thank you, God, for unmerited favor. So how do we do this? How do we show this grace? How do we become examples like David? We pray. We read, we constantly study, we use it. What's the best way to grow in something? Do it. I don't, I don't know if I can be grace. Well, try it. I promise you, if you try, you might succeed. Do it. Labor in the Lord's vineyard, in the Lord's vineyard, sorry. Be an example wherever you go. There is no one that you should not be, that you should be afraid to share God's, God's word with. No one. I was talking to one of my students this week, and they were talking to me about, they were giving an example about something. And they were talking about homeless people and people who are dressed a certain way and people who are not dressed a certain way. And so one of them said, well, I know if you go somewhere and you see someone disheveled, you'll move away from that person. You won't be a part of that person's life because they're disheveled. They don't look like you look. And I thought about that. And I thought about that's the mentality of most of us. If we're at a, a, a train station and we see someone disheveled and we see someone that's dressed really neatly, we'll move to the very neat person. And we'll stay away from the disheveled person. When there should be a balance, right? It's not about how you look on the outside. It's about what God is doing from the inside out. And is, are you displaying his mercy and his grace from the inside out? That's the important thing. And that's what we have to look at. So we constantly want to make sure that we're displaying it because there are souls, there are souls that are lost and your act of kindness can save someone's life. And sometimes it's just high. You realize that? Sometimes it's just high. 
Sometimes it's just a smile. You know, they did a study once, and they say, if you ever make contact with, eye contact with someone and smile at them, you've already made a connection with them. You don't even know, but you've made a connection because you've sort of looked into each other's eyes, and now that person's going to walk away smiling and laughing the rest of the day, and they don't even know you. They don't even know who you are. But it displays God's favor in, his, in your life. So unmerited favor rests upon us. Worship team, you can come up. And we should be able to dis- demonstrate that kindness and that grace and, the, and that mercy to all we encounter. And as I said before, this is the season of giving. So I want you and I encourage you that in this season, don't just think about the gifts. Don't just think about the material things, but think about what God can do. Think about who God is, because Christmas is going to be Christmas if you don't get a present. You realize that? It's like when the Grinch stole Christmas. And the Grinch stole Christmas, right? And so he went down to Whoville. Is it Whoville? Yeah. So he went, ah, y'all watched it. So he went down to Whoville, him and his little doggy. Poor little dog. That dog, oh, my God. And so he went down there. And he got all the boxes, and he got all the Christmas presents, and he took all the tree. He took the tree. He took the food. He took everything. And little Cindy Lou. <laughs> Bless Cindy Lou's soul. Hallelujah. Little Cindy Lou stands there, and, he, and she, looks at the, she looks at the Grinch. I, I'm just laughing how you're looking at me. You, she looks at the Grinch, and, and, and she says, he, you're taking everything. How could you how could you take everything? The roast beef. <laughs> You're taking everything. And the Grinch, he felt victorious. You remember the Grinch? He felt victorious. He was standing there Christmas morning with all these gifts. And he's like, I have stole Christmas. Because they connect Christmas with gifts. And then that morning, what does he hear in Whoville? Yo, what a, yo, what a Christmas morning. <laughs> I don't know if that's the song, but I bet y'all gonna go watch the Grinch today. <laughs> Y'all going to watch the Grinch today. And, and then he says, all of a sudden he's standing there. What does he say? What are they doing? They're singing. Christmas came. It came without boxes and it came without gifts and it came without, without ribbons and bows and I don't know the rest, but it came. And then he realizes something. That all the material things in the world mean nothing. But God's unmerited favor. Yes. His unmerited favor. It means everything. And they said the Grinch's heart grew. And it grew. It was big. It was on the screen and it popped. It was so big. But that's how our heart should be. Our heart should be so big. Because God's unmerited favor is on our lives. And that same love we should give. Because when the Grinch went down to Whoville, what did he do? He celebrated. Little Cindy Lou took his hand and set him down at the table. Like David did with that lame man. And he partook of a feast all because of the unmerited favor. He didn't deserve it, but they showed it to him. We didn't deserve it, but God gives it to us. And because he gives it to us, we should share that unmerited favor with everyone in their good, in their bad, and in their ugly. It doesn't matter. 
because God's grace. What is it? It's sufficient. It's sufficient. It can heal the brokenhearted. It can deliver those who've been bound for years. God's unmerited faith can do, favor can do anything. If we let it, if we let it, please stand with me to this morning. I want to pray with those who, who have been thinking about this whole gift of salvation and its freedom. And, and you've thought, no, there's something to that. It can't be real. God really can't just give and drop everything and, and forgive you of everything. But yes, he can. So this morning I want to say a prayer for those who've, who've never walked in God's grace. Who's never given their lives to God for him to, to move and to touch. And I want to pray a prayer for you this morning. It's a simple prayer. But it'll change your life forever. So... I want you to repeat after me. Lord Jesus, every eye closed, every head bowed. Lord Jesus, come into my life. Change me. That I may walk in your unmerited favor. Be Lord and Savior of my life. I love you, God. And I trust you, God. Jesus name if you say that prayer this morning with me then you are now a member of the kingdom of God and God welcomes you in he welcomes you in and everything that has happened before is gone and past so if you said that prayer with me for the first time I want you to be brave and I want you to lift your hands and though I can indicate it can be an indication that you are now a member of the family I just want to welcome you in just want to welcome you in. Amen. And for those of you who did raise your hands, we'll have someone here waiting for you at the altar just to give you more information about what it means to be a member of the kingdom of God, what it means to be someone walking in God's grace. And for the rest of us, I just want to give a corporate prayer. So that over these next few months or over these next few weeks as you're out shopping, you're out getting all of your different gifts and blessing people, remember that it's not all about the gift, but that it is about the demonstration of God's unmerited favor. And so, Lord, if you could lift your hands with me, Lord, I thank you for your people and for blessing them and for touching them, oh God, and for just covering them with your unmerited favor. And that they will receive and walk in your grace and your power. And that they will be an example of righteousness wherever they go and whatever they say. That it will be you using and, and moving with them. So I thank you for each and every individual here. Lord, heal the hearts that need to be healed. Deliver those who need to be delivered. Set free, oh God, those who need to be set free. Strengthen them, oh God. So that they will be examples of you in this land. So I thank you for it, God. And I give you the glory. I give you the honor. And I give you the praise. In Jesus' name, amen.